Yes, yeah. Colin is going to prepare us now. Sorry, sorry, Winnet. <laughs> sure, yeah, Back row, this should be, isn't it? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the door, yeah. Um, Colin's really coming, uh, come tonight to show us about um, the Valley Works in Edinburgh and prepare us for Saturday. For our, uh, I know you keep saying it, uh, for our hopeful visit there, a visit for those who want to go. Yeah. Right, um, we'll leave that to you. Okay, <laughs> one or two things I want to tell you, but we'll we'll have a little, I'll have a chat with you half time or when we're having a cup of tea. Okay, so over to you now, whatever you need to do, and thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Okay, my name is Colin Barber, I'm the chairman of the Rudy Moon Valley. Uh, History Society. Uh, I was down in Brumbo about 15 months ago, uh, a few well speaking people down there, and a guy came up to me afterwards and he said, you know you pronounce Freedom Ruin 15 different ways and all of them are wrong. <laughs> I said, well, thank you for sharing that with me. <laughs> and uh, last Monday, two days ago, we had a visiting professor from the University of North Carolina at Charlotte and he's writing a book on uh, the manufacture and disposal of weapons during the, during the Second World War in Great Britain and he said that we knew something that he didn't and that was how to pronounce that word. <laughs> <laughs> right, the way this works is because I find out when I do a number of people in going all the routes I go that some people don't hear very well and some people don't quite catch what you say. So interspersed between all of this, it's written down in short sentences and big words, right? So everybody gets the drift of it, right? I don't stand in front of you and talk to you normally. I stand at the back and the pictures drive it. This runs for 59 minutes, not 58 or 60. And nobody will sleep through it. And there are two or three grim pictures in it, but they're they're not for a salacious reason, they're merely to demonstrate a point and we'll scoot over them. So I'm going to go around the back here and hopefully you're going to look at the pictures. Okay. Right. This is the Creedon Moen Valley and normally uh, when you come on Saturday you'll be entering about there. And those you can see in the distance there, three big pea buildings where they manufactured pyro and mustard gas in the war. It's an absolutely beautiful area. Now to understand what happened here, you need to know why did ICI build a chemical weapons factory at the place it was built at? Why ICI? <laughs> <laughs> why a chemical weapons factory? And why at that place? And why at Valley? Uh, at the Hague Convention of 1905, over 100 countries agreed that there'd be no use of poison weapons in future wars. All the great and the good turned up, including the Dalai Lama. At this point, Germany had a large surplus of chlorine, which was an unused product, byproduct of it providing 90% of the world's dye stuffs. It was the first country which, perfect, which perfected deep blues. And Bayer and uh, Basseff and Hirscht and all of those companies were part of a cartel called the IG which made them. Now they made a and the German chemical industry were called the IG, big group of them. The UK chemical industry at this time was disparate and geographically widespread and it only produced 10% of its dye stuffs, although it did produce 90% of the world's textiles. Germany imported most of its nitrates from Chile and Costa Rica, about 350 to 400,000 tonnes per year. It's before World War I. Uh, most of this was in Chile. There was a, a belt of guano, which is back droppings, which was about 300 miles long, 6 miles wide and 7 miles deep. Obviously sold to them by a fly-by-night outfit. Oh. Nitrates were the basis of the manufacture of explosives. And everybody thought that 
if there was a war between us and the Germans, uh, Britannia still rode the waves in those ties and the Germans wouldn't, wouldn't be able to get most of its nitrates and therefore it would uh, uh, attenuate its uh, ability to make war. Now about this time this guy came on the scene in government circles, a guy called Fritz Haber. Fritz Haber was one of the greatest chemists ever. He won the Nobel Peace Prize. He was also extremely cuckoo. Uh, he, uh, and uh, that's the sort of status of the guy. That, that was a person who's paid peer group. That's Einstein. And Fritz Haber worked for the IG and he convinced the German High Command that the use of chlorine gas at the Western Front would force the Allies out of their trenches and make a more efficient use of their limited explosive capacity. Uh, the premise was you get 700 canisters of chlorine upwind from the Thomas trenches and you let it loose and as it's heavier than air it clings to the ground it goes along the ground on the prevailing wind down the Tommy's trenches they come out the trenches and you go <coughs> and the Germans pick them off. Now also he made a beautiful uh, political argu argument this wasn't a chemical this wasn't a weapon therefore it didn't break the 1905 convention they said we love it and it began an escalation in the use of poison gases with the Germans always leading and the Allies struggling to catch up. I think it's fair to say they made the best poison gases and we made the best gas masks <laughs> which is like your goalie being your best player in a football team you know not very not a winning position and uh, as we were interested in gas masks I thought I'd demonstrate a few to you this that's an American one and a British one and a French one and a German one that's Russian ones. Well, they always had a problem over there, didn't they? Oh, God, look at that. Can you imagine wearing that and trying to fire, fire, fire a rifle? Uh, that's a mock-up of uh, Nurse Edith uh, Cavell and the girls, Goodness. treating the, common, the people coming back from the front. These are German. That's not the guy you think he is. <laughs> right? Now, you can see the problems here. These were German gas masks. Can you imagine attempting to fire a rifle when you're wearing those? Uh, the uh, Americans, of course, always had an eye for the business side, and that was uh, onions it was peeling there. Of course, you had them for all sorts of uh, animals. That's a horse. He doesn't look happy, does he? No, he is. And that's, uh, that's an American one now. I used to spend a fair amount of time in the United States, and when I flew that way, I was always jet lagged. And I used to wake up at four or five o'clock in the morning and go in the bath and leave the TV on. And he says, a horse is a horse, of course, a horse. Mr. Red looks just like him, doesn't he? Yeah. Uh, that's a Rolls Royce of a gas mask. I thought that looked to me like Lord Woolton, but uh, it's a German one, so caring. And of course, in the front line, in the First World War, they didn't have any comms. They used pigeons. And there's them feeding a pigeon chute. And this is a, a pigeon box. There's the filter. And there's the birdie in there. Oh, I hope that's, that's British because the workmanship's so good. And that's got to be German, hasn't it? I mean, the dog looks German. <laughs> now, I'm going to show you a shocking picture of the only Belgian nun who was not raped by German paratroopers in the First World War. <laughs> Give us a kiss. <laughs> right, I just want to show you a couple of slides here because I want to demonstrate a point. Uh, this is gassed by, this is a detail from gas by John Singer Sargent. And uh, the most famous poem of the First World War was by Wilfred Owen, who was a, pu a, a pupil of Stowe School. And uh, the motto was a quotation from Horace. But uh, the more literal translation of that was, uh, the sweetest death of all is to die for one's country. Uh, I'm afraid I would not have subscribed to that at all. The sweetest death of all is to die in your nineties, to die in the arms of a buxom young woman smoking a big cigar and drinking a bottle of Chateau bottled wine. Uh, definitely not that, Wilfred. Somebody taught you wrong there. Now, the reason I show you these two is I'm going to show you some gory ones which are mustard gas is neither artistic or poetic <coughs> it is neither of those 
one drop of it will do that to any part of your body. Uh, it tends to aggregate around the damp part of a person's body. That's a Canadian guy. Uh, this is when the blisters have, 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 have uh, gone down. This, unfortunately, is uh, this is where his uniform was, and you see that there's no damage to him again here. But in the scrotum area, it aggregated again around the damper area of his body. Uh, these are ones for taken from the Second World War, which, as you can see, uh, how anybody could th uh, think that that didn't hurt people is uh, something along with their reasoning uh, processes tell you briefly, and I'm going to come back to him, about a fellow called J.B.S. Haldane. Scottish aristocracy uh, was one of the great rascals of science. Independent, nasty, brilliant, funny, and totally one of a kind. Uh, he uh, was a communist. He went to live in India in the Second World War and taught, gave up all his money. And uh, in the First World War, he uh, used to test the mustard gas on himself. Uh, he was a, a geneticist and in 24 he published a remarkable work of fiction, Daedalus, and it was the first book about the scientific feasibility of test tube babies. And he wrote, uh, in 27, he wrote a monograph on being the right size, which is about respiratory systems. And the premise was, uh, if you're big you have lungs and if you're small you, have, you breathe through your skins, i.e. Uh, elephants against ants. I'm going to come back to him in a moment. Uh, now, uh, this bit I'm going to go through here, this is the facts as you find them, not the popular conceptions. These are not my ideas, they're not my thoughts. I'm an historian, this is what, this is what the record shows, right? Uh, many famous chemists who were also humane men with Christian ethics developed chemical weapons. They considered that blowing people to pieces with explosives and shrapnel or crippling them for life was barbaric. It was proposed and implemented that by the use of chemical weapons, fatalities would be reduced. Any injuries would generally be short-term and not persistent. The enemy would have the overhead of treating many short-term casualties and thereby depleting their resources. And there is some, uh, this is a reportage from 1920 from the Cabinet Office Statistics, which came from the Ministry of Pensions. This is, uh, and they... Uh, found that uh, in 1915 to 18, 180,000 there were 180,000 gas evacuations from the front line, and 3.3 percent of them died. Uh, if you look at the uh, people on the battlefield, percentage of deaths to total casualties due to all weapons was 37 percent, so it was roughly a twelfth of it. And a consensus of medical opinion in Great Britain, France, Italy, Germany, and America appears to be in agreement that the following tabular statement of comparative effects of gas and gunshot, uh, and you look at gunshot on the left and gas on the right, pain, much, little, death, frequent, unusual, mutilation, not infrequent, never, detention in hospital, months, weeks, permanent uh, disability, common, rare, degree of such permanent uh, uh, disability when present, often severe, practically always slight. Of the total disabilities caused by war to British troops, 2% were due to gas, 34% were wounds, and 64% disease. Now that is not stating that if you were in a particular bad spot and you breathed a lot of it into your lungs that you weren't going to die. You were, but generally you did recover. Uh, the same Haldane in 1925 wrote a very famous monograph called Callinicus. There are five copies of it in the British Library system. If you ever want to read it, uh, you can get a copy of it on an interlibrary loan. And he noted, because he was in the chemical corps in the First World War, this probably was with French troops, many coloured troops have been observed to be less susceptible to the effect of mustard gas than most white troops. A small number of white troops also had been observed to have this quality. So he made the proposal that if you must have gassed an area three miles by two miles and you march your coloured troops in, with white officers of course, and you went down there you will be able to take it over with relative ease. And this started a canard which ran for many, many years that coloured people did not experience mustard gas as badly as white people did. And this ran right until the 1950s uh, where they were testing this at, uh, at, at Porton Down. Now this was in India in 1941, 
these were some tests and this was some uh, uh, some air which pressed the mustard gas up into a pipette which dropped it on this guy's back. Now this guy would either add a shirt or a uniform or a treated uniform or a treated piece of gauze and that's, and that's where they dropped it there onto his back and this is the result. How anybody could possibly think that the guys didn't experience it has uh, just been on my belief. Right, there was also a Scottish problem in between the wars if you look at uh, the Scots, when they went into battle, went into battle in the kilt. And, they went, and when they went into battle in the kilt, they, they marched along, and the mustard gas laid on the floor. So what happened, of course, is as they went along, it kicked up and it went up the kilts. And they didn't like it up them, as, as Corporal Jones used to say. And uh, a guy in the war, and the British Army, what they did is they designed long-legged bloomers, chemically treated bloomers, and long-legged chemically treated hosiery until a guy in the war office in 1936 said why don't you make them wear kilts trousers and that solved the problem so between the two wars poison gas continued to be used despite the 1925 Geneva Protocol which found the signatories not to be the first user of chemical weapons but they, but they made them anyway in case the other guy used, used them first it was used in Manchuria by the Japanese, in Abyssinia by the Italians, and on the northwest frontier and Iraq by the British. In the late 20s, squadron leader A. L. Harris, later to be famed as Bomber Harris, used uh, mustard gas on the tribesmen in Iraq, and they dropped the policing cost down from 14 million to 4 million in one year. The Chamberlain government decided to prepare for a war where somebody used the chemical weapons against us first and the ICI conglomerate was asked to build a number of factories to provide chemical weapons on an agency basis it didn't wish to be known as war profiteers and uh, the site at uh, Rida uh, cost 3.2 million pounds and they got 60,000 pounds at the end of the war Randall Works, the first factory was built on Wig Island in Runcorn it was called Randall Works it had 500 tons of storage but it was right in the middle of an industrial area and there's an urgent need to find about 3,000 tons because if you're going to prosecute a war you needed to have that amount to feed your frontline troops. There's the River Mersey, Mersey. there's the Manchester Ship Canal, there's Wig Island, there's Kemet Works and there's Randall Works. At the Valley Works at Freedom Ruin Valley had a limestone hill which could be excavated to store bulk, bulk mustard gas. It would be possible to build factories below the hill and take the vesicant and put it in the bombs and shells that, and you could store it around there. And on the valley there, as you'll see on Saturday, this is as it was in 1757, dead straight. That's how it was in 1859, dead straight. But you've got a clue there, there's a foundry yard and they were keeping it straight to drive water wheels. Uh, this is how it was in uh, 1927. Uh, the Grosvenor family, at the turn of the last century, uh, put in the Myler Tunnel to drop the water level to drop, uh, uh, and uh, expose the lead seams without having to remine them. And that meant that the river at Creedamuin now only flows for, eight, for four months of the year. But not this year. It's still flowing. It's not stopped. Okay, so what do you need to build a, a chemical weapons factory? From foundations, roads, rails, people, a lot of water, a lot of electricity, and access to the tidal estuary for throwing the dirty stuff out. Uh, firm foundations, yeah, they had them there, although the River Allen needed to be di diverted, and the, uh, 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 and the old river course filled in. Railroad electricity, yeah, they had them. Local labour force, uh, the local mining contractor, Hadum, Hawking and District United Mining, were well known to ICI and they would be able to excavate the tunnels and level the valley floor. Sufficient labour force in a reasonable geographic area, many of the experience in the chemical industry, this was mainly directed labour. Got to take something on board here, you didn't say, hey, I want a job there. Uh, they went all over the country and they imported people and they said, you will go and work at so and so and so and so. People at uh, Freedom Moving came from uh, Middlesbrough, Bristol, Kent, 
Widnes, Runcorn, Liverpool, and uh, they took uh, a tranche of people out of Liverpool, and they said, you're going to work down at Marquille near Preston, uh, um, at Wrexham, and they said, oh no, we can't do that, we can't get there and back, don't worry, you're going to live down there, bring your toothbrush. And they went down on a Monday, they introduced them to the work, and they billeted all 1,500 of them the same day. Water, the River Allen only flows for four months of the year. Uh, the Allen Viaduct uh, provided water, and some from uh, the mines, and also some from the wells. This is the Allen Reservoir, and it flowed down here. Big 15 inch pipes, by mould, two 15 inch pipes were taken off, but either side of the factory, and they're still down there. Uh, there's a guy called uh, 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 Glyn Parry, was 14 when he, and, and he put them in, he dug them out, the trenches for them. He was 14, he went home first week, he gave his mummy's wage packet, and he had five pounds in it, and she said to her husband, have you seen this? He said, yeah, I'll take him to work on t tomorrow. So he went, and he went up to the cash guy, said, you paid him too much, he's only 14. He said, no, no, oh no, he's paid on the lump. And he said, and he said well, I don't get paid that. He said, well, get another job but not here. So the river diversion was planned and built by Eric. There's Eric. Died two years ago. 98.8. And he was frantic to get his telegram from the Queen. <laughs> and he told us, he said, call him on the day I'm 100. You bring the chaps over and we'll drink the vintage champagne I put down in the wall. I said, Right, I'll be down there, right? So he died and I phoned up Sheila and I said, uh, Hey, hey, I'm awfully sorry, but still you get the champagne. She said, they never had any. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the, that is the River Allen. <laughs> that is the River Allen. Uh, that's a pumping station on the side of it. They used to pump the water out of the river over into the uh, 76,000 uh, gallon static water tank. And that's the river with a bit in there, and that's building 45, which I'll tell you about briefly. This is further down the river. Uh, I'll, we'll tell you some stories about that when we go around it. And this, that is the River Allen. And that's the Dolveclus, which is a brook which, which flows in from the side. Still, still the River Allen, and that's the outlet from uh, uh, those tunnels you saw. You can see that... Uh, when the water is going down there, there's no friction, it goes down like lightning. Okay, access to the tidal estuary. Right. There was, on the site, an effluent disposal pit. And it was 60 feet in diameter and 30 feet deep. And across it was a, a wall. And you pumped all of the effluent in one side along with, with, with the sewage and you treated it and you pumped it over the other side and on the other side there were three pumps one main pump and two reserves and then you pumped it two miles up a 15 inch pipe to the top of the hill and then it went four miles down the other side through a 12 inch pipe into the tidal D estuary right this is the that's the base of the 60 foot pit there This is the treatment side of it. That's soda ash. That's a soda ash chute. That's so, a, a soda ash safe. And you could go down there if you were worldly wise and swim around in there and sort the blockages out. <laughs> uh, this is the other side. You can see there is the big pump. And what they used to do is as you're going two miles uphill, two miles times 15 inches, there's a lot of volume there. So what they used to do is when the tide was the wrong way, they'd pump it and sluice it. And when the tide was turning, they start pumping and take the sluices out. And they're going from here, up past Norfolk, down here, down to that little gully there, which we'll show you in a moment. Okay, that's going uphill, and, that, and the pipe was normally three foot underground. That's right up the top of the hill, and there's a sluice. Uh, some places you couldn't go three foot underground, so they put a little bridge in and the pipe up the middle of it there. Uh, this is another sluice gate and that's right at the side of uh, the school in North Op, uh, and that's another sluice gate there. That's the school 
That's them filling in the 12 inch pipe going downhill in 1986 with slurry. Uh, when they put the A55 in they found a sluice box and they didn't know uh, uh, what it was. Went down under the ground there, under the ground here, this is as it is at the present moment. Uh, I was speaking to a builder the other day, he's just about to put 800 houses on there. Uh, still, still you can see the piping here going into the D estuary and that's into the estuary on the receding tide. It was tested every two weeks and at the end of the two weeks there were no reports of any contamination. There's a famous tunnel system there and work started on it in 39 and we finished in 41. Antelope Field was another temporary storage as was Woodside. Built in 39 to 41 by Hadum. About a thousand men worked three shifts for six days and one shift on the seventh day. It stored about 3,000 tons, mainly brought down from Randall. There were charging and bonding sessions, sections in different chambers there. So you got the mustard gas in there in the big tanks, which I'll show you in a moment, and you could move it down into other chambers where you could put it into <coughs> munitions, wait for 24 hours, see if it leaked, and then move them out. Uh, and post-war they added some, some more bits in there and they stored 5,000 tonnes in there until 1958 and that was the uh, UK strategic reserve of mustard gas. That's the pumping house for it to pump the air into there. That's, that's and it's pumped up this great big uh, uh, chute there into the beginning of the tunnels. Uh, where it went up the tunnels and up a flap into a false ceiling. Across there was a false, a false mild steel ceiling. That's looking up to the north chimney to go up, uh, the north tunnel to go up to a chimney up there. These are the 65 ton, ton tanks in place. There's the false ceiling. These are the feeder tanks which all came in by rail and some came in by road but mostly by rail and these were brought as the feeders in to take to feed the big tanks or alternatively to take things out of the big tanks put them in there to transport them elsewhere this is the south tunnel taken about 15 months ago uh, that's the A tunnel uh, that's uh, no that's D, D south and that is looking up the south tunnel and you can see the things that have happened to this over the last 70 years. There is the iron door which leads up to the tunnel shaft. Uh, the air vents used to run underneath there but it's, it's flooded now because the pumps have been removed. This is going up the shaft, that's Sam at the front there. We're about to look up to the old chimneys. There's the service door for it. Those fans in the top there were 76,000 HP. So you had that great big building at the building pushing the air in flipping it up into the false ceiling, through the false ceiling, through the chambers, <coughs> through vents in the floor, <coughs> up these chimneys and out into the bright, nice blue yonder. These came down in 86 and that picture is copyrighted to us and it's our logo. And that's how they are now. They were taken down in 86. Right, there's a decoy site at Kilken and there's the firing butt for it and uh, the, uh, that's my granddaughter, I think she lost a shilling there and uh, <laughs> uh, I, th I think if you found it, he didn't give it back to her. Magnificent views from up there, absolutely magnificent. Uh, we thought that the decoy site was somewhere about here and the way the decoy sites worked was they had big baskets full of flammables and they used to fire they used to fire charges from here up cables up to this area somewhere and they would explode them and they also have tanks of water with oil on the top of it and they drop they 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 roll bricks down into this and it would be burning on top of the water and you get a great big splash of flame so somebody who was flying over would think a bomber dropped there all right uh, this is a 1945 photograph reconnaissance picture of of that field and we put that over the current Google Earth sign so we know we're there we think we're going to be able to recover part of it uh, the two farmers who own it are dead keen to recover the uh, to recover the uh, 
charging bunker and it's not listed or scheduled so we're in business. This is the valley works when, when all the buildings were up. Uh, that building's still standing and some of this is as well. Uh, it was divided up as follows. Those were offices. These were where, where you made the mustard gas. This is where you put the mustard gas into the, into the different um, munitions. And this is where you put explosives into the munitions. The brown bit up this side is above ground so you could run up there if you had a leak. Thank goodness they never had to try it. I, I just looked at that and I thought, well, what if the wind's in the wrong direction? You know, yeah. So mustard gas is uh, uh, like an air spray, it's like an aerosol, you know. Uh, but it debilitates rather than kills. It's very persistent, smells of garlic. It hydrolysizes in water and is chlorinated by bleach to be quite, quite, uh, um, uh, and it wouldn't hurt you. Uh, but the problem is when they dump this stuff in water, they've dumped it in lumps and what's happened is it's, it's got a crust on the outside. So when fishermen pick it up, their fingers go through it and uh, pull so-and-so's. There were two types, Runcol and Pyro. Uh, the easy way to look at this is Runcol was for aeroplanes because it had a finer spray to it. And that was invented in 1932 at Sutton Oak by a fellow called Phillips Booth. And his daughter lives on Unst. The farthest north point of uh, habitation in Great Britain, and she comes down and sees us occasionally. Okay, Runcol, uh, I don't need to know that. There were two Runcol buildings at uh, Greedham in R3 and R4, and uh, they were designed to produce, produce 50 tons a week. That's one of them there in the background. Uh, you'll see a movie with all, all, all these on Saturday. Uh, each of the five factories there, R3, R4, P4, 5, 6, had their own chemical supplies and the only commonality between the five of them was water, steam and electricity. This is, the, uh, 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 this is looking in the wrong called buildings. You had all the people on this side, a glass screen down here and all the dirty stuff over here. And that's how they used to feed the chemicals in there. Uh, pyro uh, was a different type of manufacture, uh, bigger globules. There were two buildings, P4 and P5, intended for use, but they're never used for production. P5 was used a little bit in 1944. And these are them there, they're grade two listed buildings. They're all standing, they've got artifacts in there, cranes and so on, and they will be helped in September of this year. Uh, a lot of work will be done on them. Uh, and we'll be walking around one of these on Saturday. Right, just let me... I need to tell you something about the atomic bomb because it's really important that people understand what actually happened there and the connection with the atomic bomb. So if we go back to the Kaiser Wilhelm in 38, this guy's Otto Hahn and this is Fritz Strassmann two great scientists. This guy was one of the best scientists of the 20th century. Uh, and they're experimenting by aiming neutrons at a piece of uranium. As you do, you know. A chunk, a, 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 a chunk of uranium and you aim neutrons at it. And that's the kit they used. <laughs> you could have bought that in, my, you could have bought that in Woolies, couldn't you? Uh, uh, and when they're cleaning up afterwards, they found barium. Uh, they didn't understand this because they got uranium and neutrons, and when they come to sweep up the budgie cage afterwards, they've got barium. They said, how do we get barium? So they sent it down to their pal down in Stockholm called Lisa Meitner. This is one of the most marvellous ladies, marvellous uh, scientists ever. And this is a guy called Otto Frisch, who was a very good scientist. Lisa had been forced to flee Germany. She was female. She was the only PhD in physics in Germany. She was the first one in Austria and she was Jewish. And she was being visited in Stockholm by her nephew Otto Frisch. Who's, uh, there's a commonality between these guys who are the great mathematicians and physicists. All of them were concert standard pianists. Almost every one of them. Fission, they said, hey, 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 so what about this? When you've aimed your, 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 your neutron at it, it's split into two, barium and krypton. And if 
as it's gone in, one neutron's gone in, two has come out at a heck of a speed. Now, if at least two come out and they hit two other ones, and you take that through 80 generations, you know, one, two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, you're going to get a tremendous explosion, which at that time was calculated to be 2,800 thousand tons of TNT because that's the biggest bang ever and that was in Halifax Harbour in 1919 when a uh, when a munition ship went up but they soon found out that it's not all of it that did that only a, there's, there's just an isotope U235 a small part of it which occurred seven parts per thousand so to make a bomb you need a few thousand tons of it so it wasn't very practical so they knew it, it was nice to know, but hey. Uh, and the stuff they were trying to separate was the same atomic weight, but slightly, slightly lighter. And there's no known way to separate it. Until in Birmingham, the same Otto Frisch and this guy Rudolf Piles were both enemy aliens working at Birmingham University. And the story goes that they had got to report to the police station each evening. And the British police weren't in any hurry to tend to the Germans, so they used to be kept waiting, and they had a flip stick, and they said, well, what if we got some of this stuff, this special stuff, and what if we got enough together, how much would it take to make a big bang? And they said, one kilogram, which is about the size of a golf ball. So now it becomes a possibility you can make a bomb. And they passed that up, up the route, and the government formed the Maud Committee, this guy died in Rithin, didn't he, James Chadwick? One of the great scientists of all time. Uh, Nobel Prize winner. This is uh, uh, Thompson, Nobel Prize winner, uh, as his father was. This is Patrick Blackett, Nobel Prize winner. This is John Cockroft, Nobel Prize winner. This is Oliphant, who won the Hughes Prize. And this is Philip Moon, who won the Hughes, Pro the, the, the Hughes Prize. Six of the, six of the best scientists ever to leave this country. And they sat down and they came up with the following findings. They said that this guy Seaman down at the Clarendon, and he recently, recently thinks that a process called gaseous diffusion is possible. And it goes like this. If you take uranium as a gas, and you heat it and pressurise it in a chamber against the porous membrane, the lighter isotope will pass through the membrane more quickly and give a, a slight enrichment in a collection chamber. By using this stage as input to the next stage and feeding that out through thousands of stages, enough fissile material could be produced to make two bombs a month. This would take two years to achieve and cost up to £50 million. A Spitfire cost £10,000. We only had £20,000 left in the whole of the country. We were broke. So, it's decided you must prove if it works before we go down that route. Prove prove that you can give us the fissile material and then we'll see if we can take it farther and they said okay we'll form something called tube alloys and we decide this and the R&D will be carried out at building 45 and Friedemuin in a redundant pyro mustard gas factory a Metro Vic at Trafford Park Manchester were contracted to build three prototype cells at £150,000 and send them to Friedemuin so Rita Moore in 41 to 53, these two guys ran the bis the, the bistern down there. This is Piles. Now some of you may know this guy. That's Klaus Fuchs. Atom spy. I never gave anybody anything unless it was mine. Porkies told it told them everything. <laughs> and this is the building they were in, which is still standing down there. And there were seven scientists in, involved with ten lab. 10 lab assistants, totally segregated with separate passes, and it was under guard was the building. This is Seaman, this is Heinz London, later a very famous scientist. This is, uh, 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 I'll tell you his name in a minute, this is Kurt Mendelssohn, later a very famous uh, uh, scientist, and they all worked down there, and they stayed in two hostels, Brimbellon and um, Bryn Allen. And there is Bryn Allen. And uh, the guy who owns it, uh, we've taken some people back there. Uh, these are schematics of two of the uh, machines down there. That's some of the test equipment. This is 
Inside the building, if you don't believe me, ask Santa. Uh, this is two of the girls who work down there. Uh, this lady lives in uh, 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 Ruabon, and uh, this one lives in Lim. And this lady, she doesn't walk, she flows. She's like a galleon. <laughs> Beautiful lady. And uh, uh, they, they were going fine until the Quebec Agreement has agreed that all development of the atomic bomb would take place in the USA, out of the range of German bombers. And in 1943, we sent the British contingent, 23. Four of them were British to help with the Manhattan Project. Uh, it was run from 43 to 45 by this guy, Shul Arms, who was uh, an American Rhodes Scholar. And this is Nick Curti, who died about 10 years ago and was a great gourmet and a professor at, a professor at the Clarendon for 40 years. Uh, we continued experiments till 45 when all the test equipment and cells were shipped to Harwell and Didcot. In the post-war period, the USA refused access to fissile material production details. The Valley experiments provided the basis for Capenhurst and our atomic weapons and nuclear power industry. We couldn't have made an atomic bomb without what happened in that building down there. Back to the main site, the danger area. It was used to arm and paint the munitions before packaging them for shipment. Rows and paths were all composed of asphalt, no sparks, and explosive charges and caps were kept in the magazine separately. This is it. That's the danger area. Note those buildings, take, take my word for it, they've got wooden roofs. And those are to stop sympathetic explosions, which is, uh, uh, um, uh, which is a, a, a contradiction in terms. Uh, instead of exploding sideways into other buildings, they would tend to go, the explosion would tend to go upwards. This is the railway platform still standing, and that's where goods in came. This is where all the incoming stuff came to the site. Uh, there was a lot of changing rooms, a lot of graffiti down there. In the magazine complex, uh, explosives were shipped from Canada to, Dun to Dunham on the hill. They were sent by train to Valley where they were unloaded. They were then taken across the site to a gantry, lifted 24 feet to, to the magazine clearways and stored in two magazines. That's one of the magazines. Uh, three years ago, that was it two years ago. Uh, we're trying to recover them. Uh, what was produced? About 5.2 million munitions, many smoke generators, they shipped all over the world and they were always escorted by trained personnel from Barnum. Uh, smoke generators, you remember the film uh, D-Day, 6th of June and uh, the Americans were getting head kicked out of them down on uh, Omaha Beach and our lads went over there, the Scots guys in the kilts and uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the piper in front and uh, Peter Lawford as Imshi was out at the front of them and they started to fire on them from the Pegasus Bridge and we laid smoke and we got aboard so I do hope that those smoke, that smoke came from down there. Th these are examples of some of the uh, munitions. This is the, the, 60, the 65 pound leaker which is five gallons of uh, mustard gas in there and they tended to leak a lot. That's them load, loaded up into pallets. Uh, these are ones which were dug up empty ones. These are Levens tubes. That one had a detonator on the front and a tail on the back. And these are shells. Uh, these are just some examples of them. There's none made after 1945, so you know they're pretty old. Okay. In the run-up to D-Day, uh, we were frightened the Americans were going to use mustard gas. Uh, sorry, the Germans were going to use mustard gas. And we wanted, so we built in the middle of each of the five airfields, we built a storage facilities with the capability to make up limited munitions there. So if we had to use mustard gas in Germany in D-Day, they would be right in the middle of the airfields and wouldn't be stuck up in North Wales and Cheshire here, waiting to be shipped down to the, uh, down to the bomber airfields. And uh, the Amer we made all the mustard gas, three were for the British and two were for the US Army Air Force and all of the American stuff was made by us and paid for by lease land. Uh, those are where the factories were in the northwest here and these were where the FFDs were, right in the middle of the airfields. Okay, back to Rita Muin. In the war the cricket team played at Mull Cricket Club. There were film shows, works concerts, talks at meal times, choirs, 
talks at meal times were fishing, baits, anything you wanted, knitting, cooking, football, football, cricket, and there were dancers in the factory canteen to a resident five-piece orchestra, and others were attended in the mould assembly rooms. Uh, the five-piece orchestra turned to a quartet when the guy got posted up to back to Randall, and that's the girls there dancing. Wow. How could you possibly believe that that's not true? Music while your work was broadcast throughout the factory three times a day and the news, always good news. Uh, that's a makeup of a poster uh, of uh, uh, workers' playtime, play to a thousand people on the 5th of May. And this is the day war broke out. Now, if you notice down the bottom here, it's introduced by William Gates. He was obviously up market in those days. Because isn't that William Gates the same Bill Gates who used to be on Have a Go? Well, Bill, what have we got on the table for Mabel then? Oh, a chicken and 30 pop. <laughs> uh, on February 42, on two weekends, children's parties were given and all those people attended. We know it's true. We know a lot of people who went there. And there's some of the kids who are waiting to go. <laughs> And uh, these, this, this, this baby's gas mask here, my granddaughter got one of those for Christmas. She got some other things, I'd hasten to say, but she was dying to get one of those. And uh, I made her put a coloured baby in there. <laughs> uh, and of course you could sit those up and, and so on, and, uh, and it had its original case. Now, some of you may, may remember that... Uh, in those wartime and post-war uh, uh, children's parties, you, the, the, the parents used to take the kids there, and at the end of the evening or afternoon, they always used to have a, a copy, a 78, of when it's time to say goodbye, when it's time to say cheerio, and all the adults would dance together. Just like that, wasn't it? <laughs> and I still had a baby, yeah. <laughs> Uh, National, uh, the oh yeah, they had this uh, this thing in the war where uh, you had national saviors had war weapons week, warships week, wings for victory week. So it would be the army, the navy, or the air force, right? And uh, so for that week, uh, Mr. Thomas, who was the, the 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 manager down there, would have been the the colonel, and uh, uh, Hoffman the. Uh, Adge there would have been a lieutenant colonel right down to the guys who actually did the work with the privates and uh, so so when they came past they'd say do you want to donate something to the war effort to pay for the war and the guy would say I worked 60 weeks 60 hours here for five pound a week and you want me to give you money and he'd say well there's plenty of vacancies in the trenches <laughs> oh alright then some interesting visitors. I just want to pick two out. Uh, the King and Queen went there on actually on the 15th of July. That's wrong. Uh, that's wrong there. Uh, the 15th of July. We know that. We checked it out with uh, Winter Castle, and uh, it came uh, in the morning to Harden, uh, then to John Summers, then to Courtles in Flint, and finally to uh, Creed and Moon. And when he got there, the, the, the king was in his, his sailor suit and uh, he'd not had a cup of tea all day. And he, was, he got off and he said, where's, where's my cup of tea? And they said, oh, uh, soon. And he took his hat off and threw it on the floor and stamped on it. And one of the ladies in waiting went up and dusted it off and she took it up and gave it to him. She said, please. He said, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> but more importantly, this is the lady who's, uh, I was in love with. That's Margaret Bondfield, not Bronfield. And uh, there's the Saint of Margaret. She's born in the 1880s to lace workers in Charn in Somerset. She was the eighth Charn, I think. And she was very lucky. She got a patron. Uh, she, uh, when she was uh, an activist in the shop assistants uh, union, she got a patron who was sent to the United States for three years for an education. And she came back and she was the first lady cabinet minister in the Ramsey MacDonald government. Yeah. But unfortunately she 
was tied up with some bills which were not the way the Labour Party was thinking and she never held office again. But in the war she was the, la the person in charge of the uh, welfare of uh, Ministry of Supply workers, lady workers in the Ministry of Supply. And I've got a video clip of her somewhere and she's with spectacles on and she's practicing her speech to the TUC about 1947 or 48 and she's quite serious as she's reading it and uh, somebody says cut Margaret and she puts the, and takes her glasses off and she turns and smiles at the guy the most beatific smile you've ever seen in your life I thought what a lovely lady gone with the wind most of the buildings were burnt out drains were filled in toxic areas treated some buildings were dropped and covered over I told you those they were wooden those roofs didn't I wow go baby go burn those villages <laughs> Those are the toxic buildings. My, my granddaughter would have loved to have been on that. <laughs> Tinker toys. Tonker toys. They, they, the buildings they dropped, they crushed uh, and carted off site. They, they probably exported it they, to uh, uh, somewhere as, a, uh, as gravel for a road. Uh, this is them filling the toxic drains in. And that is them. Uh, now there was uh, uh, some stories going around. Uh, in the 50s and 60s, uh, it was fashionable to give kids uh, uh, newts or small crocodiles or caimans as presents for Christmas. Uh, they got sick of them and flushed them down the toilet. And the story was that around that area, that they had 18 foot long alligators in the sewers <laughs> because they'd, they'd, they'd eaten the atomic stuff, right? Well, could be true, I don't know, but they're not going very far because they're, they're cased in concrete. Right, so what happened after the war to all this stuff? Well, just after the war, there's a policy to grade all of the mustard gas they got into one, two, and three. And uh, it was either contained in munitions at maintenance unit or in, or in tanks at the FFDs or factories. So that was where it was all out. The lesser grades were removed from the bulk tanks at the FFDs and factories and shipped to Valley. The mustard and fos phosgene shells were decanted and the FFD tanks refilled from grade one from Valley. So what they did is they got all of the shells and munitions and they decanted them. They drilled in the side a circular hole, carried it over and decanted it into a pail and then put it in a big tank and into the major tanks. Now, the shells that were left over, there is, uh, 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 the story is that uh, the decanted weapons were shipped to Bosemore or Arpa Hill. Now, the story goes that they got a tractor to take out a U-shaped groove in the floor, got the, the metal from a Nissan hut, dropped it in there, filled it full of decanted shells, threw fuel over it, and then fired a Thompson submachine gun into it. I said, get away, Thompson submachine gun. Uh, it was a mistake because the guy showed me it in, in, in a TNA file. So, so that's what they did with that bit. All of the bad stuff, grade two and three, which was shipped to Valley, was loaded in 52 gallon drums, about 25,000 of them, and sent via the Barry docks for dumping in the Herd Deep, which is just northeast of the Channel Isles. The country's stock of grade one mustard, the good stuff, good stuff, was stabilized at uh, 9,500 tons between 46 and 58. So there's 5,000 tons in the tunnels and 4,500 tons in the FFDs. They had a special operation, they took all the stuff out of the FFDs, right, and used it to do, do something else. But in 1955, the apparatus oil smoke began and in 1958 ran continuously for two years burning 6,000 tons from, from the valley tunnels and other tanks, right? And this is all going back up from valley in the containers. As far as I remember there was 75, there was a train with up to 75 of these on and uh, they were four tons each. Yeah. 
and they were told up to now this is the now that is not Norman wisdom it was not Norman okay this was at uh, this is at Valley and you can see that they've this is the stuff which has come out of the tunnels they've dealt the big tanks they've downloaded it into this and that's the last empty tank coming out of the tunnels and that fellow there's name is Peter Woodward he was the mayor of Mould or whatever they had in those days the chief executive of whatever and his son Tom was born in the Ticey house, houses in Gwynafield and he lives up in uh, uh, up on the Isle of Anglesey uh, so they were shipped down to here about there on Randall about there and this is the last tank and up there if you blow that up you can see it's got a good job well done on there and this is the tanks being un the last tank being unloaded crashed it on its side and what they did is they took the skin off first which was mild steel and then they collapsed the lead liner melted it down and sold it back to industry and that is Kemet Works on the back of it which made uh, uh, sulfuric acid uh, this is the burner part of the uh, oil burner system AOS and that's a diesel that's a diesel furnace pointing in that direction and in this direction you pumped in mustard gas and the and the remains went up that 60 foot chimney uh, and they did that for two years until 1960 uh, there were no sparrows without uh, TB in witness for 30 years okay just two uh, just two things at the end we had uh, we were on the one show and Patrick Stewart said oh how could they possibly make mustard gas well mm, demonstration of ignorance I believe uh, if you look at the atomic bomb the connection down there when the Moore Committee reported that it was feasible most of the scientists we had were German and mid-European background but these guys weren't of the same stature as the German ones they weren't they weren't the first division guy they weren't an Eisenberg or a Hahn or a Strassmann in 4041 the Russians and the Germans were on the same side the United States wasn't in the war <coughs> we've been thrown out of Europe the Western Desert uh, we were doing poorly in we were broke but the biggest thing of all was U-boats were sinking more shipping than we were building and the probability was we would starve uh, we're talking about they sunk in one month 400,000 tons of shipping the solution to the problem with the U-boats was seen to be centrometric radar and was our primary consideration scientific consideration and most of our eminent scientists were involved in this project and not in the atomic bomb but the scientists classified as enemy aliens who weren't allowed to work on radar could work on the atomic bomb there's a conundrum it was essential we pursue the R&D work if we were to beat the Germans to the bomb the prospect of Germany with such a weapon was frightening we had to do it we didn't have any choice chemical weapons Germany was the most uh, innovative and successful user of chemical weapons in the First World War most countries made the same stuff before and during World War II in case the other side used them first and in those days, despite what's said now, there were considered to be a humane way to prosecute a war. Now on June the 4th, in the second year of the war, you may remember there's a famous speech by Churchill, we shall fight them on the beaches, we shall fight them on the landing grounds, we shall fight them in the fields and in the streets, we shall fight them in the hills, we shall never surrender. Well he was talking the talk, but he couldn't walk the walk. We'd taken all the chemical weapons we took to France back with us, but we left all of the armour and weaponry. We couldn't have stopped the Germans if they'd have come over here. The 1925 Geneva Protocol stated we wouldn't be the first user. In 4042 we were incapable of resisting an invasion by any means. And we would have used chemical weapons on the Kent beaches. This would have involved hundreds of aircraft and dozens of airfield. It was planned to bomb our own beaches if we were invaded. And some of the things we used were 65 pound light case bombs, BCVs, glass vials and uh, which would have been put on the invasion uh, uh, beaches we would have broken the Geneva Convention 
These are the 65 pound leakers, so called. This is a BCV, which this was full of mustard gas. They had those spray things you put on the road out, out behind it. And they spray it on the road. As the Germans went up the road in their tanks or with the troops at the back of the tanks, the mustard gas would have come up and got them. Uh, there is uh, a PRO file, now a TNA file, Air 52200. And in that, it gives all of the plans for us to bomb our beaches. And uh, included in this is uh, a lot of squadrons all over the country and it's all going to be concentrated in Kent because that's the only place they could have come aboard, they thought, with the craft they had. And uh, I was speaking to a guy from Hythe and a guy in Hythe, they would have dropped 675 of those 65 pound bombs on them and it would have, and, and it would have contaminated a million square yards. Now, that is not contaminated for 10 minutes. That would have contaminated for a long, long time. And in the subsequent page to this, it does state that it is sincerely hoped we will have sufficient time to warn the local population. We would have done it, and we wouldn't have thought two things about it. <coughs> Over there, in '42, the Japanese were threatening to invade Australia. They were in the uh, on Stanley's in Papua New Guinea. Most of the Australian tr troops were in the Western Desert fighting for the Allies. The Australian PM asked us for means to defend themselves from invasion. And we shipped over a million weapons to them. Chemical weapons. And they were sent from Glasgow. The, and the munitions were assembled and many were stored at Glendale in New South Wales. And at the end of the war were dumped off the New South Wales coast. They did offer to send them back. We said, no thanks, you've been very good to us in the war, we're sending you troops in the Western Desert, you can keep them. <laughs> D-Day has thought the Germans would use uh, 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 chemical weapons. We knew that we would have done in 4042. We also shipped chemical weapons to most of the potential and actual battle zones. They sent to the Middle East, Singapore, India, Burma, and throughout Europe in the invasion period. We also set up a manufacturing plant in South Africa in Clipfontein. So we didn't have to ship it all the way from the UK. I would say one final thing. The people who worked at Freedom Moon in WW2 are now either of a great age or deceased. Most of them came from humble backgrounds and they worked unselfishly to defeat Hitler. Not everyone could be a Spitfire pilot, but they could do their bit. And that's them. And that's them, as they were and as they are now. As they were and as they are now. I just tell you one thing. Two final things about these ladies here, right? This lady is called Rosina Parry, and she's 91, and she lives in Prostatin. And she phones me up every month or so, and she said, Colin, yes, Rose, you're all right, yes. <laughs> she said, I do worry about you, you know. <laughs> uh, this lady here was in one of the films you'll see on Saturday, and uh, I went to see her, I interviewed her, and I got this picture here, and I really improved it a lot and I sent it back to her and she, uh, and she had it framed at the side of her bed and she phoned me up she said the doctor's been I said oh you okay she said oh no it's social he, he drops in to see me and see who he's driving by she said he saw that photograph that you did for me I said oh yeah she said and he said to me is that you and I said yes yeah. god what happened to you <laughs> <laughs> okay that's me finished thanks who's this gentleman at the end this is Idwell Parry, and that's Idwell there, as he was, and that's his sister, they come from Triton, and she died recently, she's a smashing lady. This lady's Kenvin, uh, Kenvin, I've just, Ewing, and that's her in the wall. Uh, this lady is uh, uh, Mavanwi Pritchard Hughes, and this lady, I can never forget, an, uh, I, I always forget her name, but it will come back. Just let me show you one more thing. These are our, our presents. Uh, this just one. That's what I'll be, this is what we'll be doing on Saturday, right? There's ghosts in the tunnels. All the urban legends and the truth behind them. Mm -hmm. And the truth is much more interesting than the legends. Mm -hmm. uh, oh,
So was that your uh, uh, 59 minutes? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, can I stand up for clap? Of course you can. Yeah. Yeah. Has anybody got any questions? Can I make a comment? There was a reference to Barnum. Yeah. Well, I was stationed in Barnum. Were you? Storing nuclear bombs. Yeah. Oh, I, 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 I know quite a bit about Barnum. Really? Oh, yeah. yeah. Small world. <laughs> and uh, I've got quite a bit of information on it. Uh, oh. <laughs> what was I going to say?